Hello, hey, what's everybody doing? We want to welcome you to Chapter 19, Job Order Costing. Um, we're going to start after Chapter 18 going over a lot of the terms. Now we're going to be going and diving into two different systems, Job Order and Process Costing systems. Job Order will be Chapter 19 and Process Order will be Chapter 19. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> okay, again, you can pause the learning objectives if that's what you want to look at. All right, so we have two different types, like I said, of cost accounting systems, process order uh, or process costing and job order costing. Uh, job order costing is you're going to be dealing with specific jobs. Uh, you're looking at companies that do custom work. Um, it would be a place where, let's say, if you're buying a home and they basically said, uh, you tell us how you want it. Um, process costing is going to be more geared to the uh, manufacturing where it's more of the repetitive of the same process. So you're looking at places like bottling companies like um, Dr. Pepper, um, Coca-Cola, Pepsi Company, those ones. And uh, I want to emphasize that a lot of companies are a blend of both of these. For example, while you have these ones that can be pure job order costing with building homes, a lot of times what they're, what home building uh, does now is they will uh, set up a base kind of, there's these certain patterns. And while you might be able to customize it, there's gonna be a lot of process in there that is the same. So there is some process costing and job order costing. So most of the companies are gonna be a blend of this in some respect. Uh, but so usually they'll lean more to one than the other. Uh, so in job order costing, uh, we still focus on our direct materials, our overhead and our direct labor, but we're able to apply them to each specific job. So we're looking specifically at, uh, in this case, that we're building three different, uh, we're painting three different cars, it looks like. And we know when uh, the job eight, fifth, sorry, B15 is done, because it's when it's painted and it's finished painted, same thing with the blue, same thing with the green. Once they're done, we're good. So once we've finished painting the red one, it's sold, it's great, but we're completed with the blue one, but we haven't sold it yet, and we're still in process with the green one. We can know exactly where we are on each job at any given point, and that's kind of the point of, of job order costing. Um, our, our flow is going to be the same as anything else. We're going to take it, go from raw materials we're gonna have our direct and indirect materials. And then we're gonna have our work in process inventory that's gonna consist of the job is, uh, where the job is being produced, where we're putting our direct labor in. And then our finished goods inventory is where all of this stuff is put in at the end. We're in finished goods inventory, we're, we're ready to sell it. And then once it's sold, it goes to cost of goods sold. Here's a job cost sheet. Uh, might show you some information on there. You might need to know, you know, mainly what is on there, what isn't on there. What isn't on here is the sales price, uh, any advertising costs, uh, things like that are not going to be on the job cost sheet. All right, so here's the flow of our materials and labor. We basically pull our uh, materials as we pull it. We're going to annotate it on our ledger. We're going to create our jobs um, and then any indirect uh, materials we're going to be putting into our factory overhead ledger and, and recording it there. Uh, here's our materials ledger. So when we pull it, we're going to annotate what our report number was, how many we pulled, what was the cost of it, total price. Uh, somewhere on there should be the job number. I'm trying to see where that is. Um, yeah, I'm not really seeing it. Requisition number, maybe. Uh, that requisition number will be tied to the job order, I guess. But bottom line is, is it's showing what was pulled out of the inventory at what points. Oh, wait, no, this is the, I'm sorry, this is the ledger card. I apologize. Um, this is just showing the transaction. So we had 600. Uh, looks like we purchased 600 more, and then we we requisitioned $600 worth of units out of there. Okay, now I'm sorry, I uh, was reading that wrong. Uh, here's some more. This is what I was thinking of. Is it shows you here uh, the alarm system here and the paint that's being pulled. 
that they're going to install, I'm guessing, into the vehicles. And it's showing you how much for each job that's coming uh, through there. So that, that's what I was thought of uh, on the last one. I apologize for mixing that up. Um, here's your journal entry. When you pull them out, you're going to debit your working process inventory and raw, credit your raw materials inventory. It's a simple transfer of where it is at any point in the inven inventory. All right. So here's our direct uh, our labor cost flows. Our time tickets for employees that are working are going to be put into the job cost sheet as direct labor. Indirect labor, however, is going to be put into the factory overhead uh, from uh, salary contracts, time tickets, and other things that may be needed to calculate that. So if you have, so our direct labor costs, we're going to have our people on the factory line who are actually painting the cars or building the cars or installing stuff. They're going to have their time tickets and, and that, that's what's going into the direct labor. But you may have supervisors and other people who will be in the factory overhead ledger that you're going to put the costs into that overall factory overhead for each project and you may not be able to track the overhead on a specific project so what we're going to do is we're going to apply it and i'm going to show you how to do that here in a little bit but this is a labor ticket um a lot of times they're punch cards too for example if i'm just working in one area and that's it and i'm just working on one job boom my punch card's going to be sufficient but when i was an auditor we we kind of had these labor time tickets. It wasn't quite built out like this, but what we would do is we would select the number of hours we worked each week on each project, and we would annotate that on our time ticket and then submit it that way. So yeah, it's um it's a little different um, with these because what they're looking at it from the standpoint of um, jobs. Each one of these jobs. Uh, or could be the same person or different people because they're different jobs. So this is looking at it mainly from the job number. So the way it would be different if I'm looking up here on the uh, on this ticket, the way I did it is this job number would be down here and my name would be the same on this one and then my uh, other auditors would be on these different ones. But this job number would be listed somewhere down here and then it would be total hours and then, you know, it was just the hours we did. HR did the calculation on the rate of what we were being paid and how much we were to get paid. So that's that's kind of how it works. And it can go either way. I think doing it the way I described is a little bit better. And then you can print off the job number and show how many hours and money was spent on there. And I think that's a little more efficient than trying to piece everything based on job, looking at it from that standpoint. But that's just me, and I've never worked in HR, so maybe they have some knowledge there that would would help. So. And again, our um, debit to work in process inventory for all of the work done to each job. And we're going to credit factory wages payable. If you're doing the Lego project, these journal entries and how this flows is very, very, impor very important. Okay. All right. So what do we do with overhead? Now, what happens with overhead is, is that we really don't know how much overhead we're going to have for each project. So what we're going to do is based on prior data or whatever, we're going to have a predetermined overhead rate. It's going to be a percent. It could be anywhere from 0% to a billion percent. It could be anything you want, but it's got to make sense. So um, we're going to take our estimated overhead costs and divide it by our total estimated activity. This is for the whole accounting period. So we're going to come up with that as a predetermined overhead rate. So we could say that based on... Um, Oh, like, like, let's say we're going to say, uh, based on direct labor hours, we think that um, our overhead costs are going to be about 50% of direct labor costs. I mean, we don't know. We're just giving it our best, got, our best guess. But then once all of the overhead is calculated and entered and done, then we can take the actual costs and apply them. And then we're going we're gonna to zero out that account and close it out. And we close it to cost of goods sold as is stated right here. So let's go through a little bit of an exercise. All right. So what we're doing here is we're taking our predetermined overhead rate by using our estimated overhead costs and dividing by our estimated activity based. So we think in um, in this example we're going to take two hundred thousand dollars, dividing it by one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. 
And what this is saying is that we think we're going to have $200,000 and we're basing it on direct labor costs. So we're going to take that $200,000 of, of costs of our overhead, dividing it by our direct labor costs. So for every project, whatever our direct labor costs are, we're going to multiply by 1.6 to come up with how much overhead we're going to apply to the project. And then once we calculate that, we're going to debit our work in process inventory for the amount of the overhead and credit factory overhead. And uh, then once we record the actual overhead costs, what we're going to do is we're going to put those as a debit to factory overhead and the credit to raw materials inventory um, for the materials. Uh, then we're going to do it for the labor. Uh, and then and it's a debit to factory overhead and credit to factory wages payable. Uh, and then we're going to debit factory overhead, and then we're going to credit all of the things that we would put in the overhead, such as depreciation expense, which is the accumulated depreciation on the factory, uh, rent payable, utilities payable, and prepaid insurance, and so, and so forth. Um, it says accumulated depreciation for the factory equipment, uh, and that is correct. I just want to make sure that you understand that that's where that's going to. It shouldn't be what the balance is on the accumulated depreciation. The reason is, is because instead for the factory equipment, we're not going to depreciate. We're not going to expense that depreciation expense. Uh, we're going to put it into our inventory. So that's why it's going to go in here and not have a depreciation expense associated with it. So I want to make sure you understood that. Uh, in fact, none of these are going to have a rent expense, utilities expense. All of it's going to be put into inventory, and we're going to expense it once we sell it. So once we got the actual uh, overhead costs, um, oh, this shows cost. They don't show. Man, that's stupid. Okay, so after we record this, or, or other overhead costs, we're going to have three debit entries for materials, labor, and factory overhead. And then um, those are all indirect labor, indirect materials and factory overhead. So we're gonna put all that in there and then we're going to look and see if we have a, we're gonna net what we estimated it was and then we're gonna have to adjust the journal, uh, journal entry that to the cost of goods sold. Raw materials inventory, okay? So we're moving direct materials to work in process. We're moving direct labor. And then we're putting in our overhead applied. Once that's done, we have cost of goods manufacturer moved to finished goods inventory. Finished goods inventory then will account for cost of goods sold that moves to the income statement. And that's when we expense these things. We're putting them into inventory until we expense them. This is a flow that you've, you must understand. So if there's any questions about this, please bring them up to me so that I, I can work with you one-on-one -on -one with it or we can just go over it however the case may be. I want to make sure, though, that you uh, definitely know that, okay? All right, so let's move on to the next slide here. So this is the accounting for cost flows, the overall process here. Now you can see the T account for the factory overhead here. You see here that we had those three transactions we posted here as a debit. We had our factory overhead that we estimated. That leaves us a $200 debit balance. We have to close this, and we're going to credit uh, factory overhead and debit cost of goods sold because in this situation we did not apply enough overhead to cover our actual overhead costs so we have to increase our cost of goods sold to reflect the actual cost we received but our raw materials direct labor and factory overhead all flow to the work in process inventory and then that moves to the finished goods inventory and then that moves to cost of goods sold um I'm going to pull up my calculator here because I want to make sure that this slide is actually correct. I always want to trust but verify. So I'm looking at factory overhead here. I'm going to go 550 plus 5270 plus 1100. These were our actual overhead. We applied this 6720 to this because we took direct labor, which was uh, this 4200. Okay. And let's see if it calculated out. They said 1.6 times. Perfect. So that's why we applied our overhead at 67.20 as a credit, and we debited work in process for that amount. So you remember our we, we said that our factory overhead would be applied at the 1.6 or 
or 160% of our direct labor costs. Direct labor is only this 4,200. This is indirect labor costs. We're gonna put into factory overhead as actual costs. So our actual costs uh, exceeded our, our estimated. So we only applied 6720, but we needed to apply the total amount of 6920. So we were $200 short. So we're gonna take that 200, we're gonna credit factory overhead and debit cost of goods sold to move it over there, uh, to, to, to get it to where we expense that amount uh, in that same accounting period. Here's your summary of journal uh, cost flow journal entries. Here was our direct labor. I wanna find out where were you right here. This is our direct labor. That was the 4,200. We took that and multiplied by 1.6. That's what we did when we applied our overhead and here's our 160% of our direct labor, okay? That's probably the hardest concept to get is the applying the overhead. And so I wanted to make sure you understood that. All right, schedule of cost of goods manufactured. This is something you should be familiar with, uh, pretty comfortably familiar with. Uh, you take your direct materials plus direct labor, factory overhead, get your total manufacturing costs. Add any work in process at the beginning of the, of the period that you had. Subtract out your ending inventory and that's your cost of goods manufactured. And that's what gets moved to our finished goods. So here is our financial statements. We see that we moved $3,300 to cost of goods sold. Um, selling expenses, our net income was $600. Here is our inventory on our balance sheet, showing raw materials, work in process and finished goods inventory. So this is how we close our over and under applied factory overhead. Now, what does it mean if it's over or under applied? You think of it from the standpoint of, when I've applied the overhead using the estimates, was my actual under or over? If it was under, then we over applied. We put too much into our overhead. If our actual is higher than our uh, applied overhead, then our overhead is under applied. Okay, so that's what we're looking at, or it's, over, it's under applied. So whenever that happens, if it's under applied, and here it is, actual is greater than the applied, we need to debit our cost of goods sold to increase the amount of our cost of goods sold to reflect that difference. But if we over applied, we put too much into our um, overhead, we need to take some out, we need to reduce our cost of, sold, cost of goods sold because we over expensed the actual cost. We, we estimated it, but it ended up being less than what we thought. Um, at this point, I wanna give you your word. I don't wanna be given the word at the end of the um, video every time because when I do that, I think that um, people just sometimes just go to the end of the video, get the word and put it in there. But uh, I mean, it's your education. I hope you're not doing that. If you are, don't do that. Cause I'm gonna put these words in at varying parts of the, of the video. And it's just better to watch it than it is to try to find it. So the word today is cherry, C-H-E-R-R-Y. I like to eat cherries, um, you know, things like that. Cherry, C-H-E-R-R-Y, Charlie Hotel, Echo, Romeo, Romeo, Yankee for you military types. That is your word. Again, the word is cherry, C-H-E-R-R-Y. So to adjust the over or under applied, in this case, we remember we were over or we were under applied by 200. We're gonna debit cost of goods sold by 200, credit the factory overhead so that that factory overhead has a zero balance. And then we're gonna put it to our cost of goods sold and it gets taken care of. Uh, job order costing of services, I'm not gonna worry about that. Uh, applied job order costing and pricing services, not going to worry about that either, okay? So that's the end of chapter 19 here. Uh, if you have any questions, I guess I kind of did do the word close to the end. Anyway, if you have any questions, please let me know. Don't hesitate, all right? It's best to reach out early and often to make sure you know what you're doing so you're not wasting your time. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, please reach out. Otherwise, we'll see you guys in other videos. Take care.